want your love Hummel, and this is the Blues Harmonica Party. And this is Steve Freund, that's who you just heard playing that guitar solo on that last one. And this show, uh, the Harmonica Party is being brought to you by Electrify Records, Sidel Harmonicas, and Mountaintop Records. They're sponsoring this show. And today we're going to be talking with my friend Steve, uh, who we go back 35, 36 years, and we're going to be talking to Steve about his experiences starting in Brooklyn, where he was born, and then uh, when once he discovered blues in the late 60s, uh, he eventually moved to Chicago in 1976 and worked with a long, long list of blues greats from the city of Chicago, where he lived for 20 years. Eventually, he made his way out to California, but I'm just going to ask Steve some questions to start with about how he discovered the blues when he was living in Brooklyn and uh, what got him started on the blues, the road of the blues guitar for a living. Right. Is that what you'd like to know right now? I would yeah. like to know that well, right now. It really started in a weird way. We lived in an apartment building um, in Brooklyn and um, living there was a, well, we had a superintendent, and then we had a, a, what was called a porter. And the porter would take care of things like the garbage and maybe the leaves raking and stuff. And our porter was <clears throat> an African-American guy from Mississippi. He was already probably 60 years old. His name was Paul. And when I was about four and a half, five years old, and my mother had my brother, I had more like uh, free time to roam around and get into trouble and stuff. And so while she was watching the baby, I would wander and I found Paul. And uh, he liked me. And I used to go into the depths of the building. And he lived there with a dog. Uh, the dog was a chow. And um, he kept live chickens in this basement apartment. He was from Mississippi. He was what you call country. He was real country. He kept them in cages. And he told me he would wring their necks and cook them up. And he lived there, and he was playing this music that I didn't know what it was. But it was like hypnotic music. And when I think back on it, I'm almost 100% positive he's listening to Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong and uh, probably, you know, other Mamie Armstrong and some of the people from the 20s and 30s. That was my first taste, but I didn't know it. Right. And then later on, we used to see Louis Armstrong on TV a lot. He was on like Ed Sullivan a lot and shows like that. And even I couldn't say this was blues, but it was an intense music. And it was very soulful. And uh, it grabbed me somehow. And then, you know, we got into the uh, soul music and James Brown and the Motown sound that was popular in the 60s, of course, in New York. Very, very popular. And uh, eventually... Um, I rented a guitar one summer because I think I wanted to play House of the Rising Sun. So I rented this awful guitar from Sam Ash Music, and the strings were like that high off the action, and I couldn't play it. I returned it. And then the next year, I got turned on to blues from some of the friends I was with. And this one friend 
turned me on one day to two LPs. One was B.B. King Live at the Regal, and one was John Mayall with Eric Clapton, Blues Breakers. So that was a start for me. And it was mind-blowing, too, because these, both of those music guitar styles are very accessible to, to, to listen to. It's not really fast playing or anything, but it's almost like a spoken word type of a playing. And I could relate it to the lyrics, the vocals. So it was like a conversation. And from them, from those, I moved on to folk music or folk blues, like um, the Blues Project record. There's a record called The Blues Project on Elektra. Right. Was Jeff Muldauer was on it, and uh, <clears throat> Danny Kalb was on it, Dave Van Ronk, people like that. So I got into that scene. So when I was about 17, I wanted to play bass guitar. I was very into a guy named Harvey Brooks. Do you remember Harvey? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a Facebook friend of mine. And, yeah, and that's the same guy, but he was in The Electric Flag, and I right. love that record. So I got a job as the busboy in this local diner. And it was a menial job. I was treated very poorly. And there was this bass guitar. It was a Japanese red bass for 30 bucks at Sam Ash Music, two blocks from my house. And I saved up the money, and I went there, and the bass was sold. And in its place was the exact same make and model, but in a six-string. It's kind of like a Strat style or an SG style. So I said, you know, I'm just going to buy this, and I'm going to learn the bass lines, and then I'll come back and get a bass later. So I bought that guitar, and I never went back to bass until like 40 years later. But that was my start. And then um, I just started jamming with my friends, and we used to like plug three guitars into one $10 amp. It was crazy, you know. And whoever was in number one was the big controller <laughs> at the volume. And we played, and we went to all these concerts in the 60s at Fillmore East and Hunter College and... Didn't you tell me you saw Muddy in those guys? I saw Muddy. Point? Yeah, I saw without Muddy. a span. I saw Span one time. Right. And then the next times I went, and he had uh, Pine Top and that right. other band. And my main guy to go see and hang out was, was Bill Dicey, the right. guitar player. And his guitar player is still a very good friend of mine, is a ph phenomenal musician named Robert Ross. Oh, yeah. I know Robert And Ross. I used to hang yeah. out, and those guys would let me sit in with them. Then in Brooklyn, there was the, blues, the Brooklyn Blues Busters with uh, Johnny Ace. Johnny Ace, yeah. And John Leslie, right. John Nuzzo. Right. And Fred Palmer sometimes would play, and Danny Sperduto, and uh, Howard Levine. Right. And those guys had an op a Monday night jam. And I was just a beginner, like 1970, 71. And they would reluctantly let me play a number. And then they'd get the hook and get me off the stage, because um, I was not that good. And uh, those were the guys. And then later on, I started hanging out, like I said, with Bill Dicey and Robert Ross at the Mills Tavern in Greenwich Village. Real seedy little bar. Dicey played drums for Sonny Boy, I heard. <clears throat> I wouldn't know that. Yeah. But he, tr he was trying to play guitar yeah. and play harp. And he played upside down. Right. And I said, how come you play upside down? He said, well, I learned to play in jail, and it was dark in the jail, so the guy <laughs> next to me who taught it to me, handed me the harp, and I couldn't see it, what, and I, so I ended up playing outside. And, he pl and it was great. And we had great shows out there in New York. It was great. But eventually, I started playing at the Mills Tavern, and uh, I played on the street. My first paying gig was as a busker with Robert Ross. We played together. Hmm. I just played rhythm. Chomp, 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 chomp. And he played all the stuff. So how would you make the leap to Chicago? Well, I, wanted, I loved the blues so much, and I wanted to play so bad. Um, like, I have to interject real quick. Victoria Spivey used to hang out at this right, bar. Right, right. And she heard me play once, and she liked me. And she told Lenny, her husband, said, I want that boy on, on our record label. I want that boy on Spivey Records. And then she passed away. Right. <laughs> so, Good timing. Uh, yeah, so a friend of mine, a Professor Paul, a piano player, and I ended up going to their Brooklyn apartment and recorded a few numbers with Lenny. And I don't think it ever came out. And then I just wanted to play blues every night. I just, all I wanted to do at that point, that, that was it. I had a day job working in a sporting goods store, but I wanted to play blues so bad. I got this issue of Living Blues magazine, and they had a list of the Chicago, of the blues clubs. There were over 45 clubs listed in Chicago. New York had like one. Right. And of all these clubs, about 10 or 12 of them were 4 o'clock clubs, so you can basically be out all night right. playing blues. So I took an exploratory trip out there with my friend Paul Cooper, 
But I had met Sonny Land in 1969 in New York at a show. He was with Willie Dixon's Blues All Stars at a place called the Electric Circus. It's like, you know, well, we're all hippies sitting on the floor, you know. And on the break, they let us come backstage. They just left the door open. And we just right. started peeking in and, come on in, come on in, you know. And these guys, old guys, you know. Come on in. And Big Walter was there and Sonny Land was there. And oh my God, it was. Um, Probably Clifton James. Clifton was on drums, but B, the Span and S.P. Leary opened up the show. Wow. They were all backstage. And Too I, much. It was 69. It was about a year before Span died. Yeah. And I went up to him and I told him how much his music meant to me. It was just because his music it is, it is right, it's such right there, man. It's, yeah. it's like right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's no, he played fast and everything, but his left hand. Very it, solid. Just like Maceo. Like yeah, Maceo. super solid. And, but the guy who got me the most was Sonny Land, because um, I had heard one of his records. It was on uh, Prestige, I think. You know, he yeah. Some stuff. And for people that don't know, I mean, Sonny Land Slim was really the, the guy that got Muddy Waters recorded on Chess. If it hadn't have been for Sonny Land, Muddy might not, might, have, not. <clears throat> might not have made a record for Chess Records. That's and right. So, yeah. so Sonny Land that, that made that happen. So he was my main man, anyway. Yeah. I already had made up my mind that Sonny Lane was like the greatest thing that I've ever seen in my life. Right. Just as a person, right. as a character, as a historical figure. So did he remember you from 69? Or? No, I met him in 69. I right. went backstage and talked to him. Right. I told him, I just, I'm just starting to play guitar. I'm going to play blues guitar. I just said, this is, I just got my guitar. And he said, well, you come and see me in Chicago. When, you know, when you come out there, he gives me his business card. <clears throat> Seven years later, I went out there. I went to where he was playing. I said, I had a little battery amp with me, right. a guitar and a, a little pig nose type of amp. And I went up to him and I said, you probably don't remember me, but I met, we met in 69 in New York in, in the village. You were with Dixon. And I showed him the card. He gave right. me card and he says, oh, hell yeah, I remember you. Come up, <laughs> come up here. Come up here, boy. You know, play, some, play some guitar for us. You know, this is at a four o'clock club on the south side is the Flying Fox. All right. Jimmy Johnson actually happened to be in the audience, huh. and he would sit in, and we became friends right, right away, and we're still friends today. Wow. Yeah, it's a long time ago. But Sonny let me play, and, you know, I was basically just like a, a BB-type lead guitar player at that point. I didn't really have any of that um, rhythm work at yeah. all. That yeah. came later. Um, but I played good solos. But then when it came time to... Back somebody up. It was yeah. it was pretty weak. Right. You know, I play like single note shit. You know, stuff like that. But um, he liked me, and the crowd liked me. You know, and he invited me back, and uh, he bought me beers, and gave me some cigarettes, and we hung out. Then he, he started hiring me. He hired me to play, and gave me like five dollars. Anyway, we stayed for a couple of weeks in Chicago, and I went back to New York. And I went back to my day job. And after about three weeks, I was walking in the street and I said to myself, what are you doing? Why, what are you doing here? This is like, this is nothing. This is, you're supposed to be playing guitar with Sonny Lee and Slim and the guys in Chicago. And at that point, I had $1,000 saved up. I took a bag of clothes, my, um, my guitar, and I had a little Princeton amp, a blackface Princeton, no reverb. And I got, took a plane. I, First time ever on a plane, and I flew out to Chicago, and I got a mo motel room on the north side, and I called Sonny Land up. I said, this is Steve, the guitar player, and I'm staying. I'm moving to Chicago. And he said, oh, yeah, okay, that's great. So him and Big Time, Big Time Sarah was his girlfriend at the time. So he picked me up and took me to the gig, and he let me play. And uh, like I said, he gave me five or ten bucks. But I wasn't the, the main guitar player because he, he had either Hubert or Eddie Taylor yeah. as his main guy. And Hubert Sumlin, for people that don't know, was Howlin' Wolf's guitar player for pretty much the last, what? 15 years, maybe? 15 or 20, I, I mean, think. Hubert, yeah, I mean, he was, he was with them from, uh, from the mid-50s yeah, on. Right. Till, till yeah. Wolf died. Yeah. And Willie Johnson used to come around later in Chicago, right. too. Tried to come There's a with tape him. of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's funny. There's a funny yeah. story there. But uh, so Hubert was the first. I met Hubert on the first day in Chicago. Right. So we went back that night, and it was packed. And we came in, and Hubert, we bring this boy from New York up, and he, he lets me come up, and he takes his guitar and he puts it over my shoulder like I was like, like, 
a royalty of some sort. And I was You'd a, arrived. I was a nobody. Yeah. I was a nobody. You'd arrived. I was nobody. He never even heard me play. Yeah. He just trusted. Yeah, that's amazing. And he let me play, and everybody liked it. And we, yeah. Eubin and I were friends all the way through to the end of his life. Right. And we, I'm on one record with him and blah, blah, blah. And Eddie was a good friend and a really good guy. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, that's how my life in Chicago started. Now, did you meet uh, the Aces right away, Louis, Louis <clears throat> Myers and Dave Myers and Bilo right the, away? Those guys were really, yeah. I'll tell you how that was. Um, there was a club on the north side called Elsewhere. There was, this is before Blues on Halstead. It was the same. It was Bill Gilmore and a different guy. So this was on Lincoln Avenue and Grace on the 3800 North. And this was a, just a long, skinny bar with sawdust on the floor. And every night of the week was a legendary guy. Homesick, first night, I, the first guy sat in, with, actually there was Homesick James. He let right. me play. Right. Sunnyland had a steady night there. But sitting in the audience, with, while Sunnyland's on stage, I'm sitting with Fred Bilo right. and his wife, Lamar right. Chapman, who she was married first to Memphis, Memphis Slim, Slim yeah. then Little Walter, right. and then Bilo. So right. Bilo was a good friend to me. He gave yeah. me good inspirations. Um, and then I, after a little while, you know, I, I, I used to go see Lewis Myers all the time. He was a genius at that time. Right. He's unbelievable. Playing guitar mainly, not playing harmonica guitar, as much. Playing guitar. Yeah. Playing guitar. You produ did, did you produce an album for Lewis later? No, I didn't. I'm you on it. You played on it. I'm though. on it. His right. last recording. Right. It's on Earwig. Right. Yeah, me and John Prime right. together. That's right. And... Uh, uh, so I remember this one time Robert Lockwood. You no, know, he's like he's the big guy. You know, yeah. he's like the the, the don. The of main all, man. He's yeah. the don of anyone who plays harmonica. Mm -hmm. You want to have a Lockwood style guy, guy right. there, and Lewis could play that style. Sure, but Lewis could. was also more of a string bender. Right, he, the BB Lockwood never never yeah, bent a string in his life. Never. No. So it, I'm sitting there, one night watching Robert Lockwood, and on my left hand is. Bilo, and on my right is Lewis Myers, and I'm sitting there, this, this little guy, you know, trying to get my, wrap my head around all these different styles. Right. And they liked my playing because I could play these leads. Right. Know? And I was starting to play, like, more chords. But Bilo, so Lockwood did, uh, did, uh, did um, what's the name? Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 Oh, Red Top? He does Red Top. Right. And then Fred, Fred goes to me, he says, you see, Steve? This is what you need to do. You need to play more like a horn player than a guitar player. And I, and I took that to heart. Right. And it changed my whole life because then yeah. I, I was able to move into a different bracket and play different songs. Right. And do like horn lines, stuff like that. And so that, that changes you, you know. That sense of swing, which in a lot of ways you don't <laughs> have near as much of that in today's Chicago blues scene like you did back then. Not that kind. I mean, in the 50s, the 50s and the early 60s, you still had... A fair amount of, of jazz influenced players. Well, then you had like from the, the 30s and 40s on. Well, you had organ trios playing around, right? And some of the Chicago guys would like to try to play like that a little bit, you know. And heavy jazz saxophone players. And heavy jazz too. saxophone. We had a lot of great saxophone Sonny players in Stitt, Chicago. Gene Ammons and all yeah, those we guys. had those yeah. guys there. Right. We um and so yeah they uh, I started playing like that and then I met a lot of guys, black guys and white guys. We had a lot of. Uh, just a lot of great musicians in Chicago at the time. I met a guy named Mark Hannon, who's my dear friend. He was um, a really excellent singer and showman. His harp, he played harp, but he didn't play the little Walter style. He played more of a, a Mick Jagger style. <laughs> he played an open style, an open style, not, you know, not that. Right. But he's a great guy, a good friend of mine. And there's uh, the Bad Boys, Scotty and the Bad Boys, Scott Bradbury. Right. And I met my dear friend, Pete Crawford. Who was uh, he was playing with Jimmy Walker, the piano player at the time. I inherited and that you, gig. You I played in that band. From I inherited yeah. from Pete Quit. Right. And um, Billy Branch was good in the band at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Then Billy uh, and Pete put a band together um, called uh, what was it called again? I forget the name of now. We, we played together. I was in that band too. And uh, there was a, a, a bar called the Mirage, Mirage Lounge in downtown Chicago that we played at. And then all of a sudden, there was this huge bust. The bar got busted. And we didn't know it. But while we were doing the gigs, the cops were upstairs, and they had a special room and a booth, and they were, they were um, scoping out the criminals who were coming into this bar. Wow. And they busted us. One day, the gig's gone. What happened? 
Oh, the cops tore, tore it down. And then we found out in this article, you know, Mirage. I've heard, I've heard a lot of stories. Gravenitis has some great yeah. stories. About oh, the band was called Tin Pan Alley. Oh, okay. And uh, Twist Turner was in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he recorded us. Yeah. You know, Twist was uh, getting into the studio, I think. Now, how did you, how did you end up playing with uh, <clears throat> guys like Big Walter Horton or... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Floyd Jones, Eddie Taylor, was that was that as as an offshoot to Sunnyland? It was an offshoot to Sunnyland. Yeah. Um, Sunnyland was playing. Uh, this was this was already at. Uh, this was on Elsewhere. This Elsewhere is when I used to go see them. Then they closed, and then eventually Blues on Halstead opened up, and uh, Floyd would play bass. To Big Walter, they'd have various different drummers, and. Uh, Jimmy Smith, Jim, James Primetime Smith, you see him on Facebook. Mm -hmm. He was just a teenager at the time. His mother used to come and take him and bring him back. So he played with him, and I, I would say, you know, Big Walter was my favorite harp player. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. He was so good. Yeah. And Floyd was so kind. I used to talk to Being in Sunnyland's band or being a part of Sunnyland's little world opens a lot of doors for right. you because they, they think you're legitimate. Kind of all the South Side... Yeah, players were a part of that, kind that, of an offshoot of what yeah. Sunnyland started. It's, Sunny was yeah. like a ring. Sunnyland yeah. like took over from what I could piece together. Tampa Red was the main guy when right. everybody would hang out and gamble at Tampa Red's house. I've heard that too. And then when he got too old, the Sunnyland became like that kind of guy. Right. You know, he would have sort of rehearsals at his house <clears> and that kind of thing. Yeah. And they played. I mean, one night um, Harry Duncan, gambling. One night Harry yeah. Duncan and I. And his niece and his brother went to Sunnyland's place, and we knocked on the door, and his wife opens it up, and there's Sunnyland in just shorts, like underwear, and a, 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 a under, undershirt, yeah. <laughs> and a brim, and a brim, right, just a right, plastic right, brim, right. and cigarettes. <clears throat> and he's got four of his buddies, and they're playing poker. Right. And Sunnyland is selling them cans of beer out of a mini fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... That's the kind of stuff we would see. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, um, one of the things I just want to mention is all the different players that you've had a chance to both work with and record with. <clears throat> and uh, the first ones I want to talk about are like guys like Snooky Pryor and um, Magic Slim, B.B. Odin, that you produced their records. Yeah. And then uh, – all the people that you've basically uh, gone out on the road and played with, people like James Cotton for a number of years, <laughs> yeah. uh, Coco Taylor for a couple of years, Lonnie Lonnie Brooks, yeah. Luther John, I mean Luther Allison. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of that revolved around the Big Walter years. Right. And that was two years. Yeah. And so, any anyway, long story short, I wanted to play with with Walter. Right. I really wanted that gig. Mm -hmm. I felt I was good enough to do that gig because yeah. I played basic, good basics, you know, at that point. Right. But Jimmy had the gig. And um, I was friends with Floyd just through Sunnyland. Mm -hmm. He used to come to Sunnyland and he would say, boy, I liked the way you played. You played really good. You right. Know, I really like it. And that made me feel great. And those guys had gone back to the 50s. Well, Sunny, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Floyd and Floyd and Big Walter and, and Sunnyland. As, well, I think, yeah. you know, Floyd told me that Walter ran away from home at one point and ended up at uh, the, the Jones's house, and Floyd's mother took him in for a while. Right. And like as a foster, you know, just wow. as a friend to take, take him in. And Walter treated Floyd really weird. They had this big rivalry. I don't even know why, but hmm. Walter was kindest, gentlest. I mean, Floyd was the kindest, gentlest guy I've ever known. Yeah. So when the time came that Jimmy left the band, Jimmy and, and his mother, they moved away somewhere. Um, they let me sit in. And at this point, I tell you the reason I think I got the gig with Walter, not because only because of Floyd, because I knew how to play St. Louis blues, the way Bessie Smith did it. Right. With the with the rumba, the mm -hmm. minor rumba, yeah. and the changes, mm -hmm. and I was able to follow Big Walter time jumping. I could do it by watching him, that's and I huge. knew what's coming. That's huge. So I could jump time. Yeah. And that's how I got the gig. To me, that's how you separate the men from the boys. But it's not about playing. No, it's, it's about, about listening. It's about listening and being yeah. able to hear where the guy is going yeah. with something. And that's, to me, that's the real cue of no. the professionals from the guys that are kind of well, not quite that's what there. I, all that time I was listening at, and hanging out at the bar, I was listening. Right. And when he was doing like La Cucaracha, 
and he does that crazy time, mm -hmm. you know. You just don't know, but then you figure out what he's doing. Right. So you, you either come in, you're, you just, you you're, extend, you're extending a, a yeah. half a bar or something. Yeah. That's him. A lot of those old guys would purposely do this time jumping just to mess with the band. Right. But I got the gig, yeah. and I kept the gig the whole time, except Luther Allison heard about me and came to see me and immediately said, I'm going to Europe for 10 weeks. Do you want to go with me? I'm paying 50 bucks a night. <laughs> but it was my... I, I'm good! <laughs> it was an opportunity to go. <laughs> and I didn't even have a passport. I said, I don't even have a passport. He said, we'll get it for you. We'll get it. Give me... In. So she, I wrote it down. His, his manager, Rocky, was there. And they got me a passport in three days. All of a sudden, here I am, and I'm in Europe. Yeah. Ten weeks. Very hard tour. Yeah. Very hard. Because we yeah. played almost every night. Right. Well, you went to uh, Europe for the first time with Luther Allison. And I want to switch... Uh, switch spots here and, and talk about uh, the English influence on you uh, from the British blues scene that was happening in the late 60s and how your friend gave you those albums, the Live at the Regal, B.B. King, and then uh, John Mayall's mm -hmm. Blues Breakers, the Beano album with Eric Clapton, and how we're able to eventually trace back from, from guys like B.B. And, and even from Eric Clapton and John Mayall to all these earlier blues singers and players like uh, uh, Big Bill and Lonnie Johnson yeah, and yeah. Well, I did that Tampa by, Red. I did that by reading uh, the liner notes. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, always reading liner notes. So, you know, I would say, who wrote these songs, you know? Like on the, the Blues Breakers album, uh, Hideaway, you know, it's like, oh, Freddie King. I heard of Freddie King. He's one of the three kings. Mm -hmm. So then I would go out and buy a Freddie King record. Right. Oh, here's one. Then I, I'd look at for more. I like, and then there was um, a John Mayall album he did with um, J.B. Lenore. Well, no, he oh. did. He did. A, he had Mick Taylor on one. Oh, right. Bare Wires. Yeah. And I said, who's this guy? Oh, Albert King. Yeah, he's one of the three kings. So I'd go buy right. Albert King records. Drove my parents crazy. But basically, you you amassed kind of your own record collection. Oh, I did. Of of, of both blues and <clears throat> and and I'm assuming some jazz and R&B. jazz. A little you jazz, know. but I really like country blues. Country but blues, the country, country blues, blues in yeah. particular, you yeah. Know, I got, the tent, got into Tampa Red. I had, uh, I'd buy anthology records, too. Right. So it'd have like, like 15 different artists on it. Yeah. Oh, wow, Skip James. And I'll go, I'll go out and get, I gotta get a Skip James album. That's how I found Big Bill, an uh, right. RBF recording of some right. sort. And I went out and bought some Big Bill recordings. And, um, and then as far as the British guys go, I, there's four guys I really like. There's the um, Eric Clapton early days. Uh, of course, Peter Green, who mm -hmm. really incorporated a, um, a different style. It was a, the, it was a clean. B B At first, he sounded like Clapton, but he right. he had a, he, he took Eric Clapton and BB King and a couple of other things, and he made his own style, and it could be yeah. very very powerful. Otis Rush. He took that, and yeah. his songwriting was amazing. His vocals were great. Yeah. So he's got uh, Clapton, Peter Green, Mick Taylor, and in the last twenty years, I'm going to add Danny Kerwin. Right, because we didn't, he was overlooked. By I agree. A lot of people, yeah. he's bad. Absolutely, he was unbelievable. Absolutely. So those guys, but I'm always leaning more towards the American guys, and um, you know. So Bloomfield would have been a big influence <clears throat> well, on you. Influence, yeah, not particularly playing wise, but yeah. maybe uh, inspirational. You know, um, I would say my main the guy who really forced me in my mind to uh, to actually go to Chicago was Bob Margolin. Mm -hmm. Because I would see him playing with Muddy, right? And I said, "This is that's the coolest gig in the world." Yeah. You know, that is, and Muddy liked Bob a lot. He and did. He counted on him yep. to start. And, kind of his and right hand man. He really did. He said, yeah. "Take it home, Bob." Like you, you were know. with Sunnyland. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. Bob, uh, Bob was an influence, uh, inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you try to. I always try to relate to certain people as a, a life experience wise. And I think that I really related closest to Peter Green. Right. Because I think we grew up similarly, even though he was about seven or eight years older than me. Mm -hmm. But he came from he, he living in a Jewish ghetto area. And I think he was persecuted. Uh, he, some of his songs, if you listen to those yeah, songs. Yeah, very tortured. Yeah, I think he was persecuted as a child. Right. Uh, after World War II, which was right there, you know. It was mm -hmm. just right there. England was still in rubble. Right. And everybody's blaming everybody else. So... We had the same thing in Brooklyn, and uh, 
Um, so I relate to him. I couldn't really relate to Mike Bloomfield that much because he came from a wealthy came family. Came from a wealthy family. I came yeah. from apartment buildings. Right. And so so there's a working class kind definitely of. Definitely more of it. A working yeah. class element to, yeah. to your, your situation, Peter Green's situation. Let's play a song that you and I recorded. <clears throat> uh, I did this on my retroactive record. And this is a song of Peter Green's called Before the Beginning that I love and I love the way you play on it. Um, it's an amazing in, song. In, in Peter's style. Okay, so that was a song that Peter Green wrote when he was with the original Fleetwood Mac. 
and it's called Before the Beginning, and that's myself singing and playing harmonica on it, and Steve Freund playing the great guitar solo on that. And um, we're just talking about, uh, we were talking about British blues and the influence uh, that it had on Steve and myself, and how um, the, the, the Brits basically made it popular again in uh, places like the United States and Britain in the late 60s. And it was really because of things like the American Folk Blues Festivals that came over in the early 60s that a lot of the <coughs> groups like John Mayall and, uh, and uh, Fleetwood Mac and uh, even bands like Led Zeppelin saw these tours and were <coughs> influenced by guys like Sonny Boy Williamson, Memphis Slim, Matt Guitar Murphy, uh, Willie Dixon, all the different people that were on these shows. So um, I'm just, I, one of the questions I had for you is about uh, piano players and women singers because you've made a, you've made a lot of, a lot of your career in Chicago and even moving out to California has been with, uh, you know, original, you know, guys like uh, Blind John Davis and Little Brother <coughs> Montgomery and obviously Sonny Lance Slim. Pine Top Perkins, and then uh, women singers like uh, um, uh, Big Time Sarah, Glor Gloria Hardiman, and Valerie Wellington, people yeah. like that that yeah. you've played with. And then when you got out here, you worked with <coughs> Wendy DeWitt a lot, and your wife, of course, uh, uh, you know, playing gigs. So Mar and Maria Moldauer. And Maria Moldauer, some, Bonnie Ray. Did something with yeah. Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the piano thing is basically, I grew up in, in a small apartment. But my mother was a classical pianist. Mm -hmm. So half, literally half the living room was taken up by this piano that her parents bought her in the late 1930s because she was giving lessons. So they bought her a beautiful Mason Hamlin baby grand. And then when I got into listening to music, I was immediately, I got into, or very early on, Eddie Lang and Lonnie Johnson, right. but also Bessie Smith. Right. And I, to this day, Bessie is possibly my favorite singer. You know, right. It's a ridiculous the songs and the piano, Clarence Williams was the guy who did that piano, mm -hmm. and it was almost classical. When you listen to that early blues piano, it was there's it didn't swing at all. It was just right four four is right on there, but it fits so perfectly with her vocal style. And then Billie Holiday, I really enjoyed that, and she she changed it. She you she know, did she did, but her band was totally traditional. Right, you know, it was a traditional right. like. New Orleans type jazz blues band. Mm -hmm. Just a small band. A small band, right. right on the money, right on the money, but she wasn't on the money singing. She chopped that she, stuff up. Yeah, she, right? she'd delay lyrics and exactly. things like that. Exactly, so she yeah. made her own style, yeah. and that was fascinating. Yeah. And, um, you know, I used and she to, was a big disciple of, of Bessie. Bessie Smith. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, of course, I loved Aretha, loved that stuff. I saw her live. Mm -hmm. I was very into King Curtis, too, and his band. Right. You know, with Jerry Jamad and... Um, Cornell Dupree. Cornell, I saw, yeah. saw, saw them, you know. All this is before Chicago. And um, that's the sound, but Sonny Lane was my guy. I, I went to Chicago. I ended up playing Moose Walker. I played with him. I produced Henry Gray. Remember? Wow. That was one oh, of the okay. records we missed. Yeah. I did him. And um, then I got to... I could, I could put it this way. I could play with Sonny Land at Blues, and we'd take a break, and I would walk one block to Lincoln Avenue. And go down to Lily's, the little bar Lily's. Right. And Blind John Davis would be sitting there by himself, or with a drum, or maybe SP Leary yeah. playing. I could stand over his shoulder and smell his cigar smoke. Right. And Blind John Davis was the most prolific of all the Bluebird pianists. Right. He was He's on, on all, all those all records. the stuff. Yeah. He's on all Dr. Clayton. Mm -hmm. Almost all that stuff. Sunny Boy. Early Sunny Boy. Yep. So I had him. And then little brother Montgomery would sometimes come into the club. He's such a nice little guy. He was so nice. Hi, how great, are great you? piano player. And then we had a guy even named Art Hodes, who nobody knows about. I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. And he would play yeah. every Sunday. And I only got to go once because I played every Sunday with either Walter or Sonny Land. Right. But he was a Russian Jew who ended up coming, you know, coming over and played with Louis Armstrong. Yeah, and here he is amazing. playing right here in, in yeah. at Fitzgerald's out in yeah. the suburb. So we had Chicago was loaded with. Well, that and pine that's, top too. One of the things I did want to mention is that when you go to Chicago, and I mean <clears> you learn this right away, and I learned it from the first time I really <clears> hung out <throat> in Chicago is when I met you in '89. Yeah, 
and and went to blues. You played and, there. Yes, I, I sat right. in with sat in with you guys, and, yeah. and uh, you had your own gig there. I, did I? I can't even remember. I, just, I think I, saw I you in play. ninety. I did. Okay. In ninety, well, I, I was did. still there. Yeah, uh, but but uh, one of the things I got right away from just going in the nightclubs <clears throat> was all these musicians that we're talking about. They were all locals. All locals. And that that was the viewpoint of all these great musicians was that. Oh well, they're just local. Well, well, we have a guy there still yeah. still playing today, Erwin Helfer. Yeah, and great. He yeah. held he had yeah. like at least once or twice a month, him and Odie Payne, right? The original Odie Payne, right. And Mama Yancey, Jimmy Yancey's right, wife. Right, 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 right. They let me sit in with them. Yeah. So these are the things that yeah. I I I live for. Yeah. But as it have as time moved on, so many of them passed on. You know that that a lot of the people we're talking about these older musicians. Their grandparents were slaves. They were. And, and because they were and from great, Mississippi. And great grandparents, too. Yeah. yeah. Of course, obviously. And they were from Mississippi. <clears throat> and that really, one of the things about Chicago that a lot of people don't get, and I didn't really, again, I didn't realize this until I came to Chicago in, in 89 and, and started working there all through the 90s and 2000s, uh, was that, you know, that was the stop right up the Mississippi River straight from, up. Miss, from Mississippi. In other words, it was Memphis, St. Louis. Well, New Orleans first. New yeah. Orleans, Mem Memphis, St. Memphis, Louis. Can you said Kansas City. I would say Kansas City. But that's not no. really on the Mississippi. No? No. Okay. Well, forget that one. Then. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but. Des Moines, uh, Iowa. Des Moines. Francis no, Clay. Des Moines kind of more, that's Davenport. Davenport Davenport's Davenport. on Mississippi. That's on where Francis Mississippi. Clay is from. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, and that's where Bix Beiderbick is from. See? So, and then straight up from there to Chicago. So in other words, you had this kind of direct line from Mississippi to Chicago, and you had this, this way of life that was transported from Mississippi. I think that was also the Underground Railroad, in, back in the old days, yeah. was part of that, that system. Right. Straight up north, to, because then you can go right up to Canada. From there. Yeah. It's not far. Yeah. A little bit to the east, you get up to Toronto. Yep. So, yeah. So I, so I find just that whole thing really fascinating that... You know, you had all these players that basically were part of the Great Migration. There were two of them, two migrations, though. The second one is when our guys got there. And like guys like Floyd and them, they worked in the stockyards. Right. That was the big industry, the, right. the cattle industry, right in the south side of Chicago. Yeah. You know, right near, just go right there, 10 minutes from downtown, you're there. So that was a huge industry. And then you had the steel mills in Indiana and on mm -hmm. the east side of Chicago, too. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? And Gary, Indiana had a scene too. Right, so sure did. It's a big, big, big thing. Yeah. Big thing. Any of the any of the industrial towns like Detroit, Chicago, Gary, uh, you know, KC, yeah. you know, all these different pla places. Well, the, the jobs Louis. opened up. The yeah. people came, but then they needed entertainment, and the musicians came. Right. So everybody got something to and do. And I think a lot of these musicians that we're talking <clears throat> about did migrate. They'd go from they'd go from Mississippi. To Memphis, they'd hang out in Memphis for a while, then make their way to St. Louis, and then eventually make their way to Chicago. So what it was a thing where people were kind of finding their way in these different cities in terms of music and, and lifestyle and everything else. And the most blues gigs, like you say, you look in the paper and it's 45 blues clubs. Who's not going to move there if they're I mean, blues player? Yeah. yeah, who's yeah. not going to move yeah. there? So when we come back, we're going to play a number for you. So here's a number right now that uh, that I recorded on the Hard Shock. Heart of Chicago album that Steve produced for me, and uh, I think we first recorded this song on that. It's an old Tampa Red number called But I Forgive You. It goes like this. <laughs> In a pillow, mama, you put stones all in my bed, 
And you never have to agree With anything I say But I forgive you Because I love you Yes, saying I need you You know, I love you, mama and I want you back again. You put poison in my coffee, baby. You put lard in my bread. And you telling everybody that you wish that I was dead. But I forgive you because I love you. Yes, and I need you. You know, I love you, mama, and I want you back again. Playing right there. 